why did you choose Hong Kong to live and work in? Um, well, choosing Hong Kong was actually quite a selfish um, choice on my part. So I did, well, I did consult my husband, obviously, but um, it was because I wanted to have the opportunity to see my family a bit more. Are they uh, yeah, that. Yeah, so they're all they're all living in Hong Kong apart from my parents and my brother, um, who are who are back in the UK. But obviously, because of the pandemic situation, I haven't really had the opportunity to see anyone yeah. or like because most of them are kind of in that dangerous age. They're much older, so right. Yeah. Um, I need to avoid. <laughs> how do you keep in touch then? Um, I haven't been to be honest. I'm a terrible terrible relatives i mean it was mostly like i came back mostly to um take time out to see see my and visit my grandma like a bit more yeah. um and then last summer um like the whole protest situation broke out in hong kong um so that that, that essentially uh so that was related to um the freedoms that people uh should or shouldn't have um in hong kong and the amount of autonomy that they they should be allowed so um yeah so basically since that um it's really restricted kind of movement around the city for like on certain days uh wins correct me if i'm wrong but uh rumor has it that uh <laughs> that you faced racial discrimination when seeking employment in Hong Kong. Is it true? So there is always this impression, like I, I was told a lot that because of the way I look, because of my heritage, um, there would be situations where the schools or perhaps the parents wouldn't want someone who looked like me to teach their children because they would assume that I wouldn't be as qualified as someone who you know actually comes from that place but actually in hong kong um i haven't really found it to be the case um because i think there are so many other people who were like me who immigrated to canada or the us or australia when they were young so it hasn't really like there is an understanding that oh these people are basically native speakers they they do, well that we are native speakers um, that, that's true and, and wouldn't get and wouldn't get faced with the same kind of discrimination once most of my students you know there, there's always this initial conversation of so where are you from like kind of awkwardly not wanting to assume and um generally as soon as i explain like that the the reaction is like oh okay then and it's it's you know business as usual um but i can see that if i had answered and said oh yeah like i i grew up in this city you know my family are from this area you know perhaps the reaction from the students wouldn't be quite as positive discrimination is uh ridiculous in the first place but uh, in your case it's even more stupid how could people uh think about that i mean uh obviously you're qualified uh one could tell that you uh you're british just by uh by the way you speak so i guess yeah. it's just not not the case well um um i i find a lot of the time it's more it's more prevalent in the people who haven't met a lot of native speakers who are not so familiar with english so perhaps like absolute beginners from you know more remote areas right. perhaps would say something like that but in general like the people in the city they don't yeah so what what it's like uh, working in the british council hong kong do you find um, the working environment uh, satisfactory I, I think I, I really enjoy this working environment. Um, the office is full of really interesting people. Um, they have a fairly extensive um, training program and it gives you a lot of opportunities to um, present, you know, if you're particularly interested in various topics related to English or education, you know, you are, um, you are encouraged to 
take advantage of you know the resources that are around like the different people's experiences so yeah I, I found it like really nice to work in um by the way are you going to pursue um doing delta in the near future um i it's something that i would like to eventually do but i think right now i i would probably prefer to do a do a degree in um, childhood studies or education mm -hmm. because i feel like that would be more related to what i'm teaching so right now i'm teaching many more young learners than i am adults and i found that like for me that's that's more interesting there's more um development and kind of mysteries to solve <laughs> from that that side whereas i feel like teaching adults english is like i'm not saying it's a, it's not a challenge but it feels like there are lots of answers that people have already found out and yeah and you never know whether it was your influence or whether it's their learning background that uh, got them to to that top of knowledge here I, I see i see what you mean and when it comes to kids it's just uh yeah it's more challenging but more rewarding in the end Speaking of students so could you please mm -hmm. um describe a perfect student for you not necessarily an a student but just the student you you would enjoy teaching most um I think the students I enjoy teaching the most would be the the type of person who likes asking questions. Like they, they're someone who is generally quite curious about um, the world. I mean, they don't like they don't have to be great at English, but if there's someone who's open to asking questions, like someone who would look at look at something and you know be actually be thinking about it for me that's the best type of student i mean one thing that um that can be quite difficult is when a student you know they come into the room they expect a handout and they sit there and they don't say a single word the whole time and they just say hi thank you they answer the most basic of questions and and yeah. expect Mo everything from you. <laughs> answers. Yes, no, yes. good. <laughs> yes, yeah. So um, I feel like those people are kind of going into the classroom expecting a lecture, whereas um, from my own point of view, like a, a, an English lesson shouldn't be just, you know, the teachers there presenting all the stuff. Um, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but um, it's not my preferred way right. of of teaching. Yeah. It's not a communicative approach if you just collect exactly with right exactly. So you know, students who will communicate back right. are the best ones. What What is then a perfect teacher in your opinion? What does it take to be a good teacher? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I think like being flexible most of all um being someone who responds to the people in front of them as opposed to you know like i said you know walking in and expecting a lecture um i think i think it's quite clear like what my style of teaching is <laughs> like <laughs> um i i guess you are an enabler you know the one who enables students uh, and helps them um you know overcome obstacles in, in the learning process yeah I, I i think i like to try and do that you know whether whether that's always happening you know who knows especially with those monosyllabic students um, but yeah like i i think yeah being someone who you know listens to what the students are actually doing and even even simple things like responding to the day to day, you know, someone who's amazing and outspoken, you know, they could be very different another day. And also, like seeing students as people, like as opposed to people, like as opposed to, oh, this is a level, this is a room that I have to be in on a certain hour of the day. And, you know, and actually thinking about the students as 
individuals and seeing what they need and how they can be very different just like in the one class or the one group you know you might have very different personalities despite them like having the same level as it were you know they're they're capable of achieving different things that, that that's a very good answer <laughs> thank well, you yeah because, <laughs> thank you so much uh, i can't agree more than that so yeah <laughs> thanks yeah. for that my last question will be the one that i skipped um so now that you're living in hong kong uh closest yes. to your relatives um be it a bad relative for yourself uh, <laughs> as, as you said that's your word uh well, yes, yes. What it's like living in Hong Kong? I think I think Hong Kong is a very very busy city. Um, but one of the things that I think I enjoy the most about it is that there are two sides. You know, if you enjoy living in a city, like being very busy, having a lot of like shops and restaurants and like things around you, that's great. Um, but on the other hand there's also a lot of nature a lot of countryside there's a surprising amount of space you just have to be willing to go out and look for it wow um so and with the public transport being as good as it is i mean we could get to an island beach like within an hour well, like and it is, it is like extremely convenient and and beautiful in a lot of senses um but yeah i'm a i'm a city person so i enjoy <laughs> the city that was something surprising for me to hear that mm -hmm. you have days off on uh, monday and tuesday well uh that's i mean there are there are still teachers here who who kind of struggle like if you have a family mm -hmm. um definitely having a normal weekend is something that um they value but then like but then for us, it actually doesn't matter so much. And we find that um, having a Monday and Tuesday um, weekend, as it were, right. uh, it's better because then there are fewer people around the city. Um, the shops and restaurants aren't as packed and that's especially important like right now. Right. So, yeah. So that's positive thinking. You managed to actually find the, the great pluses about having days off on monday and tuesdays yeah that's that's and yeah. you know what it's, it's easier <laughs> it is and they are in a row so uh you don't have like monday and friday days off they're in a row so you can plan yes, a correct. break yeah so, yes yeah hey, thank you thank you wince uh no you're welcome yeah yeah <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> see you. see you. yeah see you